the first paper, uh, which uh, shares the best paper of each car with uh, the paper on resolution of the colors conjunction that was presented yesterday, uh, is politeness for the theory of outer bright data types, um, which is going to be presented by Ying and is co-authored by Yoni, Christophe, Jane, Pascal, and Clark. This is a pre-recorded lect uh, lecture, so I'm going to play the video. Hello, everyone. I'm here, I'm Ying. I'm here to present the joint work with Yoni, Christoph, Jane, Pascal, and Clark. The talk will have two parts. In the first part, we'll give some background and introduction, and the second part is about our contributions. Let's start with the concept of data types. So intuitive understanding, uh, the, the, the data types is many sorted. It has element source and structure source. It has constructors, the C over W1 to WN to the T. In this form, the W1 to WN could be both element source or the structure source. Well, the T must be structure sort, because T is being constructed from by the constructor C. Correspondingly, it has selectors that SCI over T means to select the i-th argument of T if the T is constructed by the constructor C. And also the testers that if is CT test to test if the T is constructed by the constructor C. Let's see an example, the theory of list, which is a data type theory. It has an element sort LM and a structure sort list. It has constructors NEO, which is a Mullery constructor with sort list and append that uh, from LM and list to a new list. It has selectors S append zero, which means to select the first argument of the, by the append, which has the sort LM and the S append one to select the second, attempt, second argument from append, which is list to list. And another example of the theory of tree. This example, the theory of tree, we are working with it through the, throughout our presentation. So it has three sorts, alum, list, and tree. It also has constructors neo and append, but append here is append tree and list to be list. So it is be treated as a list of uh, trees. It has additional constructor counts from alum and list to tree, which we can treat as uh, the alum as the root of the tree and the list as the children of the tree. Let's see the example at the right. Suppose L is being constructed by append over A and append over B and neo, then the L is a list with the elements A and B. Then suppose T is being constructed by counts over C and L, then T here has the root with C and the trails A and B, which is from the list of list, list L. So now we, we know the data types. Let's go to see the theory combination. This is example that we see from this formula. The S append zero over X and S append zero over Y are selected terms which form the, the theory of list, while the minus operator is from the theory of linear real arithmetic. So this formula is actually from a series that combined from the two series. So that's why, uh, that's how the theory combination works. And the theory combination attracted a lot of interest in automated reasoning and SMT. SMT is a framework that working over many series. So for example, consider the theory combination of data types and, and for example, bit vectors. Then the core of the SMT will uh, coordinate between the solver of the uh, data type theory and the bit vector theory. So that's why we care about the theory combination. More formally, the goal of theory combination is that given decision procedures for the satisfiability of formulas in disjoint series T1 and T2, we want to construct a decision procedure for the satisfiability in the union of T1 and T2. And in order to do that, we need to first do the purification as a first step. So still the same example, we have this formula and we can introduce a new variable E1 to represent the first term as append zero over X. Then the original formula becomes E1 minus the second term equals to A. And again, introducing the new variable E2 that represents the second term. Now we have these two parts of the formula. And the blue part is purely from the theory of list, while the red part is purely from the theory of linear real arithmetic. So that's how we decompose a formula into two parts and with every, each part is uh, in a pure theory. And notice that the, the two parts share the variables E1 and E2. So the Nelson Open Theorem gives us a safety guarantee of theory combination. And before that, let's see the definition of arrangement. Arrangement over a set of variables, for example, here the wxyz, 
is a formula that indicating the equivalence relation over these variables. We usually uh, using the delta to, de to denote the arrangement. So it must be, uh, so for this example, we can see that W and X is in one equivalence class, and while the Y and Z are in another equivalence class. So the arrangement must be govern all the variables in the set. It cannot be a partial partial W equals to X. So we can, we, it should indicate in all the, the rela equivalence relation between all the variables inside of the, the set of the, inside of the set set. And the Nelson Open Theorem says that um, the formula phi is satisfiable in the union of the theory T1 and T2, if and only if there exists an arrangement over the shared variables, V is the set of the shared variables such that the purified version phi i union with the arrangement is satisfiable in the corresponding theory t i. So that we can consider the formula in a separating way. But it has a requirement that the two theories should both be stably infinite over the set of common swords. Common source is the source shared between the two theories. And the stable infiniteness, infiniteness of the theory t with respect to s is that for every t satisfiable quantifier free phi, there should exist a satisfying interpretation A such that the domain of the A on each sort in S is infinite. So for example, the theory of integers is stable infinite because the domain of the integer we know is infinite, but bit vector is not. Bit vector is a fixed length vector. So for example, the eight bit vectors, it has domain only in two to the eight, which is definitely finite. So that the bit vector is not stable infinite, which means the Nelson open theorem cannot work on the theory combination over a bit vector and another theory. Then here comes the politeness. The benefits of politeness is that if a theory is strongly polite, then it can be combined with any other theory. So if we prove that data type theory is polite, strongly polite, then we can combine the data type theory with the bit vector theory. That is what the Nelson open theorem cannot give us. Um, this is actually a trade-off between the two theories. So strongly applied is a stronger assumption than stably infinite. So it is like we, uh, it, as, it assumes a stronger assumption on the first theory while relaxing the assumption on the another theory. And the theory is applied if it satisfies two directions of the property, properties. The upward direction is that every model can be arbitrarily enlarged so that we can always find a model that has arbitrarily large domain cardinality. And the downward direction is that there is an witness function that transforms any quantifier free formula phi to an equivalent quantifier free formula such that if the new formula is satisfiable, the new formula is satisfiable in a minimal interpretation. That means the downward direction means that we can shrink the model and the upward says we can enlarge the model. So the two, two directions of the properties. And it is the strongly applied to give us that good property, but we have done a simplification in the paper that we prove that if the witness function is additive, then together with the politeness, it can, they can imply the strongly applied. Then, then we only need to focus on the politeness. Here is an intuitive understanding of the politeness theorem. As, uh, imagine we have a formula phi that purified, with purified version phi one and phi two. We ask the solver for the first theory to get in the interpretation A, which denoted as the orange circle, that satisfying the phi one union with the arrangement. And we ask the solver for the second theory that get an interpretation B, uh, which denoted as the black, cir black circle, that satisfying the phi two union with the delta, with the arrangement. Now we want to somehow get an a merged version of the two, two models. So what we want to do is to find an isomorphism H that can mapping from, can shift from the, the orange circle to the blue circle, that the blue circle can agree on the shared parts with the black circle. Then we can have, we can have a merged version for the original formula. But in order to, to have that isomorphism H exist, we need to satisfy two conditions. The first one, the equivalence relations should be consistent on the shared source. This one is guaranteed by the arrangement because we are giving the same arrangement to the two parts. But the second condition, the cardinality should be same on the shared source. Then thus we can have the isomorphism. This one is given by the politeness. So assuming the first theory is polite, then from the downward direction, we can shrink this orange circle to be the minimal model 
and it is minimal, so it must be smaller than the A star, which is our goal. Then from the upward direction, we can enlarge this minimum model to, to A tilt. That's what makes the A tilt to have the same cardinality with A star. Then we can make this isomorphism H from the A tilt to A star. That we can get the A star as we desired. Then we can have, the, have an answer for the original formula. So that's the intuitive understanding of quietness. Now let's go into the uh, details of the two directions. The upward direction we call smoothness. A theory T is smooth with respect to S A for every satisfiable quantifier free phi in the theory T and every satisfying interpretation A, there exists in satisfying interpretation B that has any cardinality larger than A on S. So that means we can enlarge the domain arbitrarily. Smoothness is a stronger assumption than stable infinite because the stable infiniteness only requires for infinite, but the smoothness requires for arbitrarily large cardinality. There's an example that the theory of list is smooth with respect to the element sort. This is because in the theory of list, the element sort is uninterpreted so that we can interpret the element sort in an arbitrary way that we can interpret it, the element sort to have a domain with arbitrary large cardinality. So that's the theory of list is smooth. Then it's also stable infinite. Now go, let's go into the second part, downward direction. It's called the finite witnessability. A theory T is finite witnessable with respect to S if there exists a computable function, which for every quantifier free formula phi, it's the computable function will return the quantifier free formula psi, such that the phi and psi are as equ equivalent under the theory T, and the psi may, int may introduce some new variables in the W. And also the psi, if the psi is satisfiable or equivalently the phi is satisfiable, then there should exist in a a minimal interpretation A, such that like the, uh, the, for the shared source, the domain of the A should be minimal. Let's understand that by example. Supposing we have this formula and the interpretation A interpreted the E1 and E2 to be B, then if we want the A to be a minimal interpretation, the element domain of A should just be the single term of B, because only B appeared in the interpretation of element variables in this formula. So that's what we call the minimal interpretation. And we want to say that it is the strong politeness gives us that good property. And the difference between politeness and strong politeness, or say the difference between finite the witness ability and the strong finite witness ability, it's these red parts with arrangements. It is because when we consider the theory combination, it has this arrangement on the formula. But we don't want you to focus on the difference between these two. Uh, we will do, do down that simplification to let us focus only on the politeness. Now we have done with the background and introduction. Let's go into the contributions. Um, we introduced the concept of additive witness. A function f is s additive. If we apply the f second time, it will output some formula that is equivalent to the input. Um, and here, delta is a conjunction over of the equivalence relations over variables, or say. The delta is the arrangement over variables whose source is a shared source. And we have this proposition. We have the proof in the paper, but omitting the presentation. So let f be a witness function for the theory t with respect to s. If f is s additive, then f is a strong witness function. So that we use the additive to remove the strong in the witness function. Now, Let's try to prove the politeness of data type theory. We need to do the two directions. First, the smoothness direction. This direction is actually trivial because like what we said for the list of theory, the theory of list. Um, in the theory of data types, the element, or when we say the politeness of data types, we are saying the politeness of data types with respect to the element source. And the element source are, un are uninterpreted so that we can interpret it in an arbitrary way we can interpret it to have an arbitrary large cardinality. That's the, the data type theory is smooth. Then the hard part is the second, the witness function. So we will provide a witness function and prove it is element additive. Then from, the, from what we say about the element additive, we only need to prove our witness function is finite witnessable. So we will show a model construction that's fulfilling the requirements of finite witnessability. <coughs> 
Now, now let's see the Witten's function, which is actually very simple. It is extended from the original formula. And without loss of generality, we assume the original formula is a conjunction of flat literals. We care about three kinds of the terms. For the selected terms, if there's no constructor already specified to X, we are adding this constraint that enumerates all the possible constructors to X. So if X is constructed by the constructor C, then the i argument must be Y. This is given by the selected term. Or the X is constructed by other constructors. And then for the tester term, uh, we specify, we explicitly specify that X is constructed by the constructor C. Similarly, for the negation of the tester term, we add this constraint that enumerates all the possible constructors C, which is not equal to C. Here are the, uh, the dots are all fresh variables. So we, int we introduce new variables to, to indicate the structures. Let's understand the Witten's function from an example. In our example, we will focus only on the first rule. And assume we have this formula, and let's focus only on the blue part. It has these two selected terms. Then the witness function will add these two constraints to the, to the gamma. Gamma is the output of our witness function. Like for, for the first selected terms, assuming the L2 can has only two possible constructors, append and D, then if L2 is constructed from the append, then the second argument must be L1 that is given by the selected term or L2 is constructed from the D, then with new variables here. And second constraint is similar. If the L2 is constructed by the append, then the first argument must be E2 that given by the selected term. It is easy to see our witness function is element additive because the rules will apply only once that when we apply the function F second time, it will not change the formula, so they are equivalent. Now we have this, for this additive witness function we need to prove it is finite witnessable. So the, to justify the correctness, we need to prove the two, two items. The first, the original formula phi and the new formula gamma should be equivalent. And second, the new formula gamma is finite witnessable. That means if there is an interpretation A satisfying the phi, we should be able to construct a satisfying interpretation B with minimal element domain. Let's see the first item. Uh, Remember that we are, we, what we can function just to do it down with these transformation rules. And we can see that these transformation rules are, are equivalent transformation rules. So that the original formula and the new formula must be equivalent. So that the first item is satisfied. Now to prove the second item, supposing we are assuming we have this interpretation A, what we need to do is to give a minimal interpretation B that satisfies gamma. In order to do that, the first we, we, need, we will remove the original selector terms because the additional constraints already express the same thing. And second, we don't like these disjunctions. It will be uh, not convenient to, for us to construct that, that new interpretation. So the way is that we follow the clue from the interpretation A, the, it will be, must be one literal being true among these disjuncts. And it could be the first one or it be the second one, but with a loss of generality, we assume the, the, the interpretation A satisfies the first eight literal. Then we pick the, the first one and then remove all the other disjuncts. That's similar to the second constraint. Now, uh, the resulting formula we call as gamma prime. And notice that the gamma prime satisfies gamma. Now, in order, uh, we are trying to construct a satisfying, a, a, a minimal interpretation B that satisfies gamma. Now it is sufficient to prove that B satisfies gamma prime. What do we do? Let's see. Still the same example, supposing A is a satisfying interpretation and we have A as this, it interprets the E1, E2, E3 all to be A and with the uh, list of variables and tree variables. But if we want to, we want to have a minimal interpretation B, then we, the element domain should be just a singleton of A. We cannot use this B, C, D things. So how to construct a set of B? First, we will construct a set of graph. This graph is constructed by that, like from the interpretation A, we can know that E1, E2, E3 have the same interpretation and like similar to the L1 and L5. And here, each vertex denotes an equivalence class. 
that induced by the interpretation A. And di different vertices should have different interpretation. Um, we also adding these edges according to the constructors. So in the formula, we have this L2 constructed by the append over E3 and L1. We're adding these edges from E3 to L2 and the L1 to L2. Now we have this graph, and since the data types are cyclic, we can sort this, uh, sort the vertices in topological order, then all the edges are from left to right. And these vertices with no incoming edges are called minimal classes. Then we will uh, construct the interpretation B over the graph. First, for the element classes, we assign the interpretation same with the A. So the E1, E2, E3 all have the same interpretation, the small A. Then we fix the element domain of the B to be just the singleton of A in this example. Now, uh, for the other variables, we, only, we can only be able to use the, the A in the interpretation. Then for the minimal classes, uh, we structure sorts like the L3 in the example. We calculate the maximum previous steps plus the longest path in the graph. Here, the resulting is four. Then we assign a list with size four with all the A, 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 A to the L3. Uh, the reason is that we, we need the vertices, different vertices to have different assignments. And then by this method, the L3 must has, a, has an interpretation that has a size larger than the previous vertices. And for the later vertices, non-minimal classes, we will ask given, the, given them the interpretation by the edges. So the interpretation of, of the L2 is uh, decided by the edges they append from the E3 and L1. We are given the interpretation from left to right. So when we given trying to give an interpretation for a vertex, all the previous vertices already have, a, have an interpretation. Then since we are considering the L2, L3, by adding this longest pass, the L3 mass has a size larger than the later vertices. So thus, every vertex will have been, has a unique size. Um, and now we can see the, the interpretation B has a minimal element domain. But now let's see if it satisfies the gamma prime as we want. Um, so consider that the, L, the interpretation B has uh, preserved the same equivalence relation with the interpretation A so that the equalities and the inequalities are satisfied. Well, for the constructor terms, since we are given the interpretation to these non-minimal classes by the edges, so it's naturally satisfied the uh, constructor terms. So now we, since we have a minimal interpretation B that satisfies gamma prime as we want, but there is a problem that when we're given the interpretation to L3, we are supposing we can give in the L3 with an interpretation that has arbitrary large sites. Well, the, in the last uh, slide, the depths are defined as the number of, number of constructors we used, we applied for a term. Now, but this is not all the cases. Sometimes L L3 could be a struct with, it could be a finite struct, like the enum type in C++ and the record type in Pascal, et cetera, that uh, consider this example that the formula u equals to the c over v and e and here v is a minimal class with finite struct sort to sort of v now suppose v has only one constructor d that from sort of a and sort of v to the sort of v well here the sort of a and sort of v have no constructors they are element source then uh, the, the, the v cannot be, cannot has the arbitrary size it can only apply the constructor d only once so that's the, when, when we construct this, the graph at the left from the formula that the U has uh, edges from the E and the V, and the E, V are minimal vertices. When we try to give interpretation to this V, we cannot give it to, with um, arbitrary size. The V must have a size with one. So what we do is, again, from the interpretation A, we can know how V has been constructed. And since V is a finite, finite struct sort, it has a finite path that how it's, how it's been constructed. We are adding these new edges and the new vertices recursively until the element level. Then V will be removed from the minimal classes. And the minimal classes now only consist of uh, variables with element source or the variables with infinite structure source. Then we can apply this, the algorithm, the previous algorithm on this completed graph. 
And now we are done with the construction. We can have a we can have an interpret minimal interpretation B that satisfying the the gamma prime. And now we proved our weighted function is finite weightable. And again, with uh, together with the additive and the smoothness, we proved that the data type theory is polite. So that's all, all the proof the proof ideas of our result. As a summary, our we introduced the notion of additive witness in the paper and we proved the data types are applied so that the data types can be safely combined with any other theory, like for instance, the bit vectors. There's another, uh, there's a question that remains open. Is there a weakly, weakly applied theory that is not strongly applied? We are not clear about the relation between the weakly applied and the strongly applied that we cannot find a counter example that is strongly applied but not weakly applied. We are not so this question still remains open. Um, so that's all for the today's talk. Thanks for listening and any questions. Thank you. Um, so now we have time for questions. Please raise your hand so uh, write in the chat or in the QA, please. Questions? Um, I have a question. So this is a very nice result. So you have a theoretical result that's showing that you, you know, can combine several theories. And it seems that this is a big part of the uh, SMT leap too, right? Um, do you know, uh, how big is the fragment of the SMT leap that's covered by your results? How do you define how big it is? Yes. I uh, was asking how 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 large the impact of the result. Exactly in the SMT leap. Uh, I would say that the combination with data type and bit vector is common. So this result gives a, give, told us that this combination is safe. All right, thank you. Uh, questions? Please, people, raise your hands. I found there are two bugs in my presentation. Maybe I can correct here. Sorry? I heard there are two bugs in my presentation. I, I don't understand. Uh, I mean, my presentation has two, has a bug when I, when I introduced the proof. Oh, all right. So if you want to comment on that. Yeah, so uh, we make the vertices to have different interpretations, not because it's not because every vertex has a unique size. It's an inductive proof on each vertices. All right. Um, Jasmine is asking you if your results would generalize to data types with nesting, for example, uh, to rows trees. I can expand if uh, necessary. Yes, please. So a rose tree is a uh, so if you have a binary tree, you have two children. Mm -hmm. But if you have a rose tree, then you have a list of children. So your tree type is recursive through lists, which is also a data type. Mm -hmm. And that particular example can be compiled away, actually. So I guess that answers my question. But in general, lists might not be a data type. It might have other properties. And then I don't know if you've thought of generalizing in, in, in any way in that direction. Uh, because I know it, with CVC4, they're talking about supporting such types. In our result, data types is just defined the test uh, only in constructor, selector, and tester. But would it work with, um, yeah, with, with more complicated? Uh, do, do you have any idea if it would generalize or not beyond that setting? We. Yeah, we are not generalized to with more operators. 
So do you mean the data types code has more more operators? Uh, no, but um, maybe Pascal understood my question, no? No, I think the question, Ying, is about um, whether you can have these kinds of nested data types that you and Yanni have been looking into, or you have maybe a data type inside of an array inside of a data type. Can this result generalize uh, to that situation? Right. So can you have a cycle? So what's the difference? In, I mean, in our definition, it could be have that a uh, list to a tree and then tree to a list. Right, but what if the list is not a data type, but it still has a nesting like that? Like a finite set instead of list or, or finite multi-set instead of list. Well, if I can step in, I, I think that as long as you have a hierarchy, I mean, uh, that you, you have an order, then you, you, you can eliminate, eliminate them one by one. But um, if you have cycles, then it's becoming a nightmare, yes. Mm. I think the short answer is we're looking into that, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Andre, you have a question, can you speak? Hello, yes, thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, I, I actually had another question about uh, possibility of adapting uh, your results uh, from the theory of inductive data types to the theory of co-inductive data types. How much of this technique would be reusable? So you do count on, on acyclicity, right? So, uh, but are, are there bits and pieces of what you are doing applicable to co-inductive data types as well? Um, sorry, I, I didn't get the question. So, so co-inductive uh, data types is a generalization. Go ahead, Yanni. Um, I, I guess this is the same quest, uh, answer as uh, Clark for the previous question. This is something that we looked into uh, a little bit, but saw that it is uh, very complicated and left it for future, future work. Uh, we do rely on a cyclicity here. Uh, and we plan to look if we can uh, lift this uh, requirement. I see, thank you. All right, I'm sorry, but this is all the time we have for this um, talk. Um, please let uh, thank the speakers and uh, congratulations on the best paper award.